Born in London in 86, Sasho Dent named British Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and helps round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting at, and helps round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, hand hells round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here, welcoming you to another exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. Today I find myself in the hut of Transylvania, visiting one of my favourite places in Romania, Brasov. This fairy tale looking setting is only a few miles from Bran Castle, the legendary keep of Dracula himself, which we visited two years ago on this channel. The local area also has a high concentration of nomadic people, and being a full-time digital nomad myself, I felt that today would be an absolutely perfect time to revisit the Sega Genesis Nomad, the bizarre portable version of the American equivalent of the Sega Mega Drive, a luxury item that many children in the 90s would fantasize about owning, but sadly, very few would make the purchase. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the Sega Genesis Nomad, and why it failed. Yeah. The year is 1995. We are in one of those strange transitional periods in gaming between two different console generations. Some consumers have moved on to expensive new 32-bit systems, such as the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn whereas others stuck with their Super Nintendos and Sega Mega Drives for a while. After all, there were many benefits to doing this, such as the large libraries of games the 16-bit platforms offered, and many people were waiting patiently to see what the Ultra 64 was going to bring to the table before making their next-gen purchase. On the handheld gaming front, the monochrome Nintendo Game Boy was very much still the dominant force leading the handheld wars and subsequently crushed the PC Engine GT, Atari Lynx and Sega Game Gear as a result. With this in mind, Sega of America would make the logical conclusion that Sega should publish a newer, more impressive handheld in an attempt to try and capture a bigger market share. The Sega Game Gear with its bright backlit colour display was impressive in its own right years prior. The components were heavily borrowed from the Sega Master System and as a result the Game Gear was pretty much a portable Master System with a larger colour palette. So the next logical evolution in Sega's handhelds would obviously be a 16-bit handheld based off of Mega Drive technology which is obviously what the Sega Nomad was. The Game Gear had many weaknesses that led to its defeat by the Nintendo Game Boy, but the biggest hole in its armour that many people will point to is simply that its library of games are just not as appealing. To combat this, Sega's next generation handheld would literally be a portable Genesis, a handheld system where you could insert your Genesis cartridges straight into the top of a system. Since a very strong case can be made for the Genesis library being better than the Game Boys and the fact that many people already owned many Genesis games, a strong marketing case could be made for Sega having a Game Boy killer on their hands. The technology for the device was already at Sega's disposal upon release, as two years earlier, in 1993, Sega of Japan had already in some ways released a portable Mega Drive in the form of the Sega Mega Jet. The Megajet featuring a six button front layout was used on many planes in the Japan Airlines fleet. These planes had small LCD televisions installed into the armrests of each seat to entertain passengers. The Megajet was designed to help pass time during long air flights. Users were able to bring their own Mega Drive cartridges. However, it is reported that JAL stopped a limited selection of titles on each flight. When it comes to the Sega Nomad, the device is essentially just a Sega Mega Jet with a backlit screen attached to the front, finally making the Genesis truly portable. This system that was an exclusive to North America was not the first idea banded around by the company. They also for a while intended to release a touchscreen handheld gaming device in 1995, predating the Gamecom for a couple of years and predating the Nintendo DS by a whole decade. 
the idea apparently was left as a concept due to the technology being too expensive to implement at that stage. The Genesis Nomad would see a release more than five years into the lifespan of the original Genesis, which would mean that the system would debut with a library of more than 500 different games. According to Sega of America research and development head Joe Miller, he actually stated that the device was not intended to be a product that would replace the Game Gear, but instead be a product that accompanied it. But then again, we have heard this spiel from executives time and time again, as I guess it is a good way to try and protect your assets if the newer system flops. In more recent examples of this style of marketing talk, Nintendo announced the DS as its third pillar to exist alongside the GameCube and the GBA, and even more recently they claimed that the Nintendo Switch would replace neither the Wii U or the 3DS, so it is a meaningless statement really. Joe Miller also stated that Sega of Japan had plans to start marketing the handheld 2, which obviously never came into fruition. If you know your gaming history, you will be aware of the incompetence in communication between these two sides, which would ultimately lead to Sega at one point having seven different bloody gaming platforms on the market all simultaneously, and that is before we get into variants like the Mega Jet and the Nomad. At one point in time, new Master System Mega Drive, Saturn, Sega CD, 32X, Pico and Game Gear games were all in circulation at the same time. They offered consumers a ridiculous amount of choice, but in many ways the company was spreading themselves extremely thin as a result. The Nomad's lack of an appearance in Japan actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. As I explained in the previous video, the Mega Drive was never particularly successful in that country in the first place. It was a system that was much more appealing to Western consumers. In contrast, the Sega Saturn on the other hand performed better in Japan than it did elsewhere, so I guess it would have been somewhat of a dumb move to release a Mega Drive system in a country that was quickly becoming obsessed with the Saturn. Also with the Genesis Nomad being an American system, you would assume the Japanese release would have occurred at a later date. Keeping this in mind, the Pokemon craze was beginning to kick off in Japan by February of 1996 the franchise that would give the Game Boy a second wind and lead to the handheld becoming more popular than ever before. With regards to Europe though, I am truly stumped why we did not get our own version of the Nomad. After all, the Mega Drive beat the Super Nintendo here, a feat it was unable to achieve in either North America or Japan. All I can think of is that the system must have performed so badly in the States that they must have seen it as a complete waste of time to release it over here. With that said though, the system's lack of availability in this region gives it a permanent level of allure and interest in those who are into their imports. Now let me talk about what this thing was capable of. The Nomad had a 3.25 inch backlit colour screen and an AV output allowing users to play games on a television screen. In some ways it resembles a bigger chunkier Game Gear but with a 6 button layout of the Mega Jet. Obviously with this system being a North American exclusive there are some compatibility issues with the system for users from other regions. The hardware reportedly has a region lock from the sources I've read online. But from my experience and what I can tell from using the system, the platform is fully compatible with most games I have tried out on the system, no matter where they are from. I have played cartridges from Europe, North America and Japan on the system with little in the way of issues. However, reportedly, if you attempt to play some of the later release games on the system, you will run into issues. Basically, in order to stop you playing games from different regions in the early days on the Mega Drive, cartridges would be different shapes in different regions to fit different countries' console slots. However, the Nomad cartridge slot seems to be big enough to accept anything I have managed to put inside it. Problems come with newer games due to the lockout technology being featured for newer titles, so later games such as Sonic the Hedgehog 3 for example will not work unless you own an American copy of the game. But thankfully the system is still compatible with a fair amount of games. Interestingly, I even discovered that the newest Mega Drive game, Xeno Crisis, runs fine on the system, a fantastic little game I was donated by the Bitmap Bureau to test out for myself. This great little Super Smash TV style game runs perfectly on the Nomad. 
which is great really as this is one of those games where to get the best out of it you need a 6 button controller. So the Nomad has the perfect button to accompany this game. It is both amusing and fantastic that people out there are still producing new hardware for such aged platforms. I absolutely love it. So yeah, that is the Nomad, a portable version of the Sega Genesis released in 1995, that you can play anywhere. This is a novelty system with a lot of upside to it, however, as we know commercially, the system never delivered, nor did it live up to Sega America's sales expectations. So what went wrong for the 16-bit handheld? Well, firstly, this device was very expensive on release. Hell, due to the system's low sales numbers, it is still extremely expensive now as well. The Game Boy was doing a fine job as a handheld, and even the Sega Game Gear had its fans. So I guess if consumers wanted a new Sega system, there were just so many more appealing options. Why get a Nomad to take your Genesis on the go when you could try the Saturn or Sega CD? Much more exciting. Then past the pricing issue, we have the system's ridiculously bad battery life. This power devourer takes 6 AA batteries that ran out of juice in as little as just 2.5 to 3 hours. 6 AA batteries certainly were not cheap back in the day and owners didn't simply have the option to recharge their systems with poor battery life like poor Nintendo Switch owners have to do today. The third issue is the screen itself. It simply does not look that impressive and if you shrink a Mega Drive game image to 3.5 inches and put it on the Nomad's tiny screen, it does not look particularly more impressive than a Game Gear game anyway, in my opinion. The image outputted by the Nomad suffers from screen blurring, particularly during fast scrolling, and that was on the system's release. Through aging, the screen looks worse than ever today if they remain unmodded. If you browse YouTube today, you will struggle to find commercials even advertising this system. The handheld's presence, even in its release year, was negligent at best, and should have had a lot more effort put into it by Sega of America, if they wanted this system to have much of a user base at all. So, due to these failings, the Sega Nomad is sadly a system that failed. It was expensive, under-advertised, and featured a poor screen and poor battery life. However, despite its flaws, the handheld is an attractive curiosity for both Genesis and Mega Drive enthusiasts alike. So I have no regrets of procuring a Nomad of my own on my journey across the US three years ago. So that brings a close to another episode of Handhelds Around the World. Let me know if you had a Nomad when it was released in 1995, if you have got around to owning one since, or simply whether or not you still want one after watching this video. I would be curious to hear your thoughts on the system within this comment section. Do not forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell for multiple videos on gaming history every single week. Yeah! Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos. These people listed here make working full time on YouTube just that little bit less scary, so I would like to thank all of you very much for helping me out. So a huge shout out to Carl Johnson, JD Robbins, Sebastian Veles, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, Asobi Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, RetroReversing.com, and all of my other patrons. Yeah. Cheerio!